Thank you. Let's give it. This is it's a, it's a hug. I I don't, I don't pat. It's quite a hug. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a connection. It's a connection. You know you know I mean you you you've got me incredibly scared. I mean, I'm an economist. I'm a Japan expert, and I'm an optimist. Th th those three, you know, normally don't go together. In fact, you know, the, the worst bit, the worst bit is this economist bit, right? And I mean, there's, there's the old President Roosevelt. Uh, he said, ah, economists talking about economics. That's like peeing in your pants. It feels hot to you but leaves everybody else cold. Well, look, you know, economics, right? Policy and all of that. Now, you know, we're going to have to live with it, right? It's something that happens, right? And what I want to do over the next sort of 10 minutes or so is just give you a little bit of a hint on what's actually going on because there's a lot of myth. There's a lot of mythology in the way, you know, economics and the world is being portrayed and particularly Japan. And I actually think that the world right now is this dangerous place. Oh my God, right? But actually there's a lot of things that can be learned from Japan. So let's just bear with me here. This is something that economists call the elephant chart, okay? Now what this is, just very quickly, this looks at personal income growth. So it's not GDP, which is the entire economy, but it's you and I. It's our income. And you see, over the last 20 years, thank you, the world's done pretty good. It's been growing by about 31%. Now, why is it an elephant? This looks at the gap between the rich and the poor. So this is the bottom, the poorest 5% of global people. And then this is half, right, the median, and then this is the top 5%, right? Now, if I take away China, the growth that we've seen in the People's Republic of China, and thank God there was so much growth, it wasn't 31%, it was only 14%. And what is even more concerning is that actually if you were in the middle, if you were middle class, Excluding China, your incomes actually went down. And of course, yes, thank you, the top you know, 5% have done very, very well. But the decline of the middle class, right, is in my opinion exactly why we've got all this discontent. If a high school teacher can no longer dream of raising a family and living a normal life, then you've got a problem, right? So that's what's going on. And Japan actually leads the world, right, in a lot of things where you actually see it's this income, this rising gap between the rich and the poor that really is the biggest, biggest source of social problems, right? Patrick always wants to know, where's Japan number one, right? Well, in economic terms, I'm sorry, this is the one chart where you want to be not, thank you, Mr. Trump, you don't want to be in this space here. This is income inequality very high. And as a result of that social problems, right, all these things here, maths, literacy, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, etc., etc. Japan, thank you, yes, is the best country in the world. It's very interesting, right? There's a lot of talk that we talk about. What do we focus on? We want a society that has low social problems. Now, what, 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 what is the important point about this chart? That my country, Germany, is better than France. This is, <laughs> this is very, very important. Now, it's very interesting, right? When you look at Japan, Kurokawa-sensei, it's, it's actually quite exciting, right? Other data where Japan is number one, right? Again, income inequality, the same thing here, right? This is social mobility. What does that mean? That means how dependent is the economic success of your children on your income level? Do you have to have a rich daddy to succeed? Not exactly good, right? And again, 
Japan actually, across the global data, has the highest intra-generational income elasticity, which is very, very interesting. So the poor kids can also make it into todai. I mean, that's really sort of a way of saying it. And of course, you get the point, yes, right? <laughs> Germany, better than France. Now, so how do we deal with income inequality? Actually, Margaret Thatcher had a great saying. She said, making the rich poorer does not make the poor richer, which is very true, right? Now, Japan is a model. Look at this. If you look at the top 10% and the bottom 10%, right? And I've just taken here the United States and Japan, right? You see, it's pretty good. You, you can be in the top 10%. There's plenty of rich people in Japan. But Japan is the only country in the world where the bottom 10% is actually taking off. This is very, very interesting. And by the way, about 60% of that increase in the bottom 10% is because of womenomics, right? Because whether you like Mr. Abe or whether you don't like him, I do not care. But the change in the environment in Japan empowering women is very much for real. That definitely is something, Patrick, that we all have agreed has changed, right, over the last 10 years. So you get the point, right? Japan has done a very, very good job. Let's talk a little bit about the realities of Japan, right? And put yourself in my position. You're an economist. You're bullish on Japan. They always say, Kordasan, Kordasan, you're crazy. How can you be bullish on a country where in 309 years, only seven people are going to be left? Right? The reality of Japan, it's demographics. Well, yes. So every day, the number of Japanese declines by about 1,200 people. Okay, that's fine. Every day, the Japanese economy creates more than 3,000 jobs. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, what is more important, death or jobs? Okay, <laughs> all right, I get the point. <laughs> but from a dynamic perspective, right, the fact that you do have job creation, right? That you've got rising female participation, that you've got senior citizens getting involved again, setting up companies, setting up foundations, right? That is what creates economic life. So all this focus on death, yes, yes, I know we're humans, we're going to die, right? And in Japan, there's old people, so there's a lot of death. But at the same time, there is job creation. And it's actually very, very exciting, you know, to think about this, right? The demographic issue, in my opinion, is not a big deal, particularly since actually now, precisely because of the demographics, we're having this positive dynamics. For the first time in 23 years, full-time employment is actually increasing. And you've got leading companies, you've got Hitachi, Toyota, uh, Mitsubishi, etc., rehiring part-time or arbaito on a full-time basis. And that creates a new virtuous cycle that actually is coming through. So the demographics of Japan, oh no, it's not a negative. It is a hugely positive force that you actually have. And by the way, I do want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese. That's still very true, because now I'm getting better jobs, full-time rather than part-time, and Tokyo is the only major metropolitan area where if you work at a Starbucks, God forbid, if you work at a Starbucks on the average salary, you can afford to buy a home within a one-hour commute. It's the only city in the world. That's impossible in Shanghai, Hong Kong, London, etc., etc. Right? So it's actually quite interesting. You get the point. You've got a new middle class that's being created. Younger people are getting better jobs. And the home that they can buy is actually quite affordable. And by the way, the old guys, old guys like me and Patrick, oh, the young are no good. Well, sorry, we are very rich. The Japanese don't like to talk about money. Do you know that 85% of all Japanese over the age of 55 own the home that they live in but have no debt? 
That is an incredible statistic. This is the richest baby boom generation in the world. So Kurokawa Sensei, go menasai, stop complaining. Go men ne, mo, mo, shitsuri shimashita. Mo, dai senpai nan desu kero mo. You see, 33 years in Japan, I haven't learned anything. You know, now what about immigration? You know, immigration is always this, ooh, la la, immigration. This, like, excuse me. Can we stop being emotional? Can we look at the data? Do you know that in Shinjuku, 13% of the people between 15 and 65 are non-Japanese. 13%. In all of Tokyo, the great part of Tokyo, right? Five years ago, 3.1% of the people who got a paycheck were non-Japanese. Today, it's 6.7%. Immigration is happening. It's in a very pragmatic way way because you actually have to want to be here in Japan and show that you actually want to be part of society. And by the way, I believe that in terms of diversity, the big legacy of the next year's Olympic, in my opinion, is going to be these people here. That you've got doubles, as I call them, right? Half. They're not new half, half, right? (laughs) Who knows this? Uh, You know, Look, look, look how scared Usain Bolt is, right, for Asuka Cambridge here. Right? This, in my opinion, is going to be the true legacy that you've got, you know, this new generation of Japanese winning medals, right, in competitions where basically Japan has never won medals before. Now, there are challenges, right? You know, it's a rainy day. And you know, it's interesting, right? I used to think... When in doubt, blame the government. Oh, the government should do this and the government should do that. And of course, we work in the private sector. That's what governments are for. You should be doing more. You should be doing this, right? I actually think the real challenges are not with the government, right? I actually think the real challenges are with us, with the leaders of private sector Japan. Look at this. Companies... These are listed companies, companies listed on the stock market, are the richest companies in the world. They have more than $6 trillion of cash sitting on their balance sheet. That cash earns zero interest, but it's just sitting there. It's incredible. And actually, over the last 10 years, you see it has shot up, right, dramatically. So companies are very rich, $6 $6 trillion of cash on the balance sheet, but they're also unbelievably catchy. They do. <laughs> Japanese companies do not pay their people. It's quite interesting, right? Look at this. Workers' compensation as a percent of profit. That's what that means, right? And you see that for small and medium-sized companies or for listed companies, Japan is the lowest that we've got in the world. It's very, very interesting, right? I'm an investor in my day job, right? Japanese companies don't pay high dividends or do a lot of share buybacks, right? They don't pay their workers. What do they do? Oh, we pile up cash. Excuse me? You're stupid. (laughs) And this is where it gets interesting because... The dominant factor in the Japanese economy over the next five years is the intensifying, intensifying war for talent. Hitachi, Toyota, is having problems finding engineers. The war for talent is going to intensify because of the demographics. So I hope that the young generation is going to stop doing this all the time and is actually going to start to turn the table because it's a buyer's market. It's no longer a seller's market that you have. And of course, for companies, this creates a big problem. Because now, it's not just, oh, you come and join my company because I'm a good company. No, no, no. You're actually going to have to convince the young generation to work for that company. That's very important. So what's your work-life balance? Is a question that's now being asked increasingly. And Japanese corporations in their normal management fra- structure have actually no answer for that. Oh, you, come, you show up at 6.30 and you, know, you stay until 11 and then you play golf on, on Saturday at 5 o'clock. Ridiculous, right? So it's going to be very, very interesting to actually see that. Now, 
Final point, the second challenge. Where does growth come from? And it's interesting, growth does not come from whether the central bank raises or increases, raises or cuts interest rates. It does not come from whether the shuhize, whether the consumption tech goes up or goes down, that causes noise in the cycle. Structurally, there's only one consistent source of economic growth, and that is the number of entrepreneurs who you have in society. And you see very, very close, you know, correlation here. Actually, America is doing a very good job, right, at doing that. This country here is Israel, one of the most entrepreneurial countries that we have on earth, right, which is kind of normal when you think about it. I mean, there's the ocean in front of you, the desert behind you, and everybody else wants to kill you. So you better be creative and entrepreneurial, right? Kind of survival here. Japan is chuto hampa. Japan is totally chew to hampa. So anything that you can do to increase entrepreneurship, to create a better ecosystem, right? That, in my opinion, is the great policy challenge that we actually have. So companies, rich but catchy, they need to start to pay their people, and a greater environment, you know, for entrepreneurs. And of course, yes. <laughs> Very important, you know. But, 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 as you know, French did win the World Cup. So, uh, you know, they, they do have something on Germany. I want to do a final point. Patrick asked me to uh, sort of reflect a little bit on what happened, you know, over the last 10 years since, we, since Patrick first started this, uh, uh, this venture. And, you know, I, I give these talks, right? And I gave a talk at one of the monster um, you know, Japanese, um, you know, uh, retail places, right? And bullish Japan. And I, I had this quote in there from Donald Trump, right? And this is, this is actually, it's interesting, right? Because I'm, I'm agnostic on American politics. I'm just a German, right? Um, <laughs> but, it, but it's interesting, right? Even my most democratic friends would agree that, that this is a good quote. This is, this is what we like about America. I'm German, you're Japanese. We are komakai. Everything is like small detail, detail, more detail. You know, America is great because we fly to the moon. No, we fly to the Mars, right? All of this stuff, right? Got to think anyways, you might as well think big. So I get this talk, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, at the end, Q&A, guy in row 15 says, Mr. Cole, thank you. That was very interesting. I want to go back to that quote. You know, got to think anyways, you might as well think big, you know? We deal with Japanese companies, Japanese companies in Niigata, Japanese companies in Kyushu. They don't want to think big. They think for their community, right? And isn't that a good thing? Because in America, everybody wants to leave the community that they come from to conquer the world. And as a result, the communities are dying. The communities are crumbling. Well, here in Japan, there is a lot of focus right, on the community, whether it's Fukuoka, whether it is, you know, what's happening in Tohoku, we had some of the great examples, right, uh, given in today's talks, right, that the small part, right, is actually a very, very beautiful part, right? Final comment, Patrick, if I can have one more minute. So th th this is, this is the, the, the other thing I wanted to share, because Patrick and I, when we have these breakfasts, there's always a bit of tension, right? Because, because Patrick sort of thinks that, I don't know, he doesn't really think that, but he claims to think. <laughs> you know, no, but technology is the solution to everything. Yeah, technology this, technology that, right? So I want to tell you an anecdote. Three years ago, I was invited to be part of a panel at the Keidanren, right? At the Japanese Federation of uh, Business, right? And they had one of the gods from Silicon Valley, one of the real gods of technology was there on the panel, right? And so, you know, he started talking this, that, or the other. He started to talk about self-driving cars, right? Ooh, self-driving cars, self-driving cars. And I said, e excuse me, uh, Mr. Tesla, um, we are in Tokyo. In Tokyo, we already have self-driving cars. It's called the subway. He went ballistic. Right? You have no idea. You don't know anything. You're completely this, that, or the other. And I said, e excuse me, Mr. Tesla, I'm just an economist. And from an economist's perspective, 
There's only one difference between a subway and a self-driving car. And that is, with a subway, with a subway the equity is owned by the people. With self-driving cars, there's three guys who get filthy rich. Thank you very much. Thank you.